Hello, everybody from WCA Physics B. I am back again, and we are looking at unit um, three on conductors and insulators. And I have our screen split again so that I have um, the opportunity to use the whiteboard if I need it. All right. So some of the stuff, you guys, again, you're going to have background in this already because you've probably dealt with circuits since you were little. Um, but we're going to look at more in-depth coverage and also trying to understand what's happening and why we have electricity. So um, we have to first look at the structure of an atom. And it talks a little bit here about how an atom, and just kind of basic terms, right, is going to have, oh, really? Oh, you did make me a circle. Thank you. I was on the side, it always corrects my pictures, but then when I want it to, it's not doing it. So we've got our nucleus with protons and neutrons in it. I'm just going to represent that with these dots, right? Because we're really not going to deal with protons and neutrons. <clears throat> what we're interested in is the electrons. And the electrons um, are found in orbitals around the nucleus of the atom. And I don't need to go through with you how you know, how many electrons are in there. We just have um, certain, I, I think of them as like certain distances away from the nucleus. The closer you are to the nucleus, the less energy it requires to be there. This is because electrons are negatively charged and the, nu the nucleus has a net positive charge, right? It's got, um, I don't like that positive positive mark that I put up there. But yeah, it's got a net positive charge. So I'll write that as our little positive sign there. So all of our little electrons are attracted to the nucleus, <clears throat> but they're also zooming around. So it's kind of like planets in the solar system in that it's a, they don't fly into the nucleus because they have their own inertia, right? So they're not going to be just flying into the center. But it does require less energy to be closer because you're resisting that pull, right? And you have to resist less when you're closer, so it requires less energy to do so. So this is a lower energy state right here. And this is a higher energy state right here, right? Just kind of to simplify things a little bit. What happens that we're really mostly concerned with it's what's going on on the outside, just these guys. So the electrons that are found on this low energy levels, any level that's interior or closer to the nucleus, they're kind of tucked in there pretty nicely. It is just the electrons that are on the exterior, the very outside orbital, that can um, easily come off or be added back to an atom. Um, you can actually physically remove these just by rubbing two surfaces together. So if you've ever like shuffled your feet on a carpet and shocked something, you've done that because you've actually been removing electrons from the carpet and you're picking those up and maybe, <clears throat> maybe you're removing electrons from the carpet or maybe the carpet is removing electrons from you. It kind of just depends on the material. So these exterior electrons that I circled in green here, those are known as valence electrons and those can be removed pretty easily from some materials. Some materials, um, electrons cannot move around very well. Those are things like glass and plastic and other insulators. Um, they have very little freedom to move and you can actually rub them off and transfer them to a different material. Some materials, the outermost electrons are very loosely bound and they actually can move in the spaces between the atoms of that material. So here we can see these electrons here, which are blue, they can easily just zip around between the spaces of these um, iron atoms. Because they can move so easily within the material, we call them conductors because the electrons can move easily throughout them. Um, an insulator, which we talked about before, 
the electrons really can't move very easily between the materials. Okay? So as a result, they're, we said they're called conductors. Um, this motion of electrons within the material is pretty random. And movement of electrons is called current. So whenever electrons can move or flow, that is what electrical current is, or also known as just electricity if you want to. So since electrons have a negative charge, if you lose an electron, then you're less negatively charged or you're positively charged, right? If you gain an electron, you are negatively charged. So when these electrons can jump around and move from material to material, say we see here with the sodium atom, the sodium atom loses an electron and it ends up with a positive charge. And the reason why is because now you have more protons than electrons, so those two don't balance each other, and the charge of the protons will win, and the whole atom is the same charge as your protons. And if an atom gains an electron, as you can see here with the chlorine, so this chlorine atom snaps up that extra electron. Now it has more electrons than protons, and it will have a negative charge, the whole atom will. These charged atoms that have either positive or, or negative charges are referred to as ions. They have a kind of a special name for them. And what's really important about the ions is that they attract each other. So positive ions are attracted to negative ions and they can kind of stick together and form compounds. We call these ionic compounds. It's probably a lot of like flashbacks to chemistry or physical science here, but that's really what they're called. <clears throat> and it talks about insulators here and says insulators does, do not allow for free flowing electrons. Electrons are more restricted in their movement due to the structure of the material. So when we looked at these uh, conductors, there's lots of really cool channels that those electrons can move through. So it's easy to conduct or move those electrons through it. And the uh, insulators, that doesn't happen. So there's like basically a lot of little roadblocks in there. And this is uh, something we call resistance. So it's more resistant to the flow of electricity are the movement of electricity. Um, examples would be things like rubber, wood, and plastic. Um, pure water is also an insulator. However, if you mix like salt in water, it's a really good conductor. So don't ever try to mix electricity and water thinking water is an insulator because most water that we drink has minerals dissolved in it, okay? And so we can use the what we know about these materials to create um, something called a circuit which allows electrons to flow through it very easily. So we want this to be made of conductors because conductors allow electrons to move through them and be, we also want to protect ourselves. So these wires are covered with an insulating coat of usually rubber or plastic or something like that to make sure that you're not going to get electricity flowing through you because you know that could be bad and that's essentially what this page is going through. And then it talks about some, some experiments you can do. You know, we talked about rubbing a balloon in your hair. We talked a little bit, or the this talks a little bit about using uh, a rubber rod. Like there are certain kits. I don't think it shows that up here, but um, I don't have one of these. I actually think it would be cool for me to get something like this just to use as a demo kit for school. Um, but I don't currently have one. But you can get these cool little science kits <clears throat> that have just basic stuff in them. I'm trying to find one. Usually comes with a glass and a plastic rod and silk and wool. Um, here's an example. Here, maybe I can just show it. Oh, this one was only 99 cents, apparently. Um, hang on. I don't think that's what I want. This is from AliExpress. That's not like a, a great place. Okay, we're going to put it right here. <clears throat> so that's what it is. And you can actually um, 
experiment with charge in this way where you can, this is just a bunch of little styrofoam balls that you can pick up using static electricity. And it's gonna have like a silk scarf and a piece of wool and plastic glass and rubber rods. And you can charge them and see which one's positive, which one's negative and so on and so forth. Another one that I like to do in um, class is super easy. You take a piece of scotch tape like this and you just put it on your table literally are I'm going to try to show you here but I'm literally rubbing it on the table like that uh, let's see if I can get this to stay you guys <clears throat> and then you take a second piece and you do the same thing it's just one of the many different experiments you can do and then you rip these guys off it probably would have been better if I put a little tab on the top sometimes I've done that before Okay. And then you watch them. And right now I'm trying to put them together and they're repelled. They will not go together. Do you see that? It's literally repelling. One is being repelled by the other. You see the re repulsion? I think it's pretty cool. I'm not doing anything. They're just repelled by each other. So when they have like charges, they are repelled. Um, I don't know what happened, but another way of doing that is we put this one on the bottom. You got to put the little tab. There we go. And you put another one a little shorter. That's too short. On top of the other one. And then I'm trying to remember if this is how you do it, to be honest. I think you pull the whole thing off and then you pull them apart. I think that's how you do it. And then, yeah, then they're attracted to each other. <laughs> so it really just depends on whether I'm taking electrons off of them <clears throat> or if I'm adding electrons to them based on my motion and whether or not, you know, if I'm taking electrons off of one, then it's positively charged. And if I add electrons to the other, it's negatively charged, so then they attract. And if I take electrons off both or add to both, they're going to repel, right? So we can kind of experiment with some scotch taping and figure out how that works as another example. So the other thing you can do is um, you can actually charge something simply by inducing charge. So for an example, if you have something, let's see here. Um, well, and a good example of that would be if I took one of my pieces of tape and it had a charge to it and I brought it next to some, for example, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this for you here, just because I think it would be easier if you could see instead of me just saying. So the, things can be charged by contact. I can touch them together and they can get a charge to them because when you touch them together, the electrons can run off of one and onto the other surface. But you can also charge just by bringing something close to it. Okay, so what happens when you charge something that's uncharged by bringing a charged object close to it, it actually causes the electrons in the uncharged substance to move. And when they move, um, they have a temporary induced charge. I'm trying to get this pointed down again. Ah, come on. There we go. So I have this piece of tape. It is now charged. I can bring it close to... Kind of see it. I'm picking up pieces of paper. It doesn't have. It's not very strongly charged, but I can bring it kind of close to those charged, uncharged pieces of paper, and it's inducing a charge in the paper. So when you look at this, what happens is, say my paper or my piece of tape here, excuse me, has a positive charge. Okay. 
And then my pieces of um, paper, those little scraps of paper that I have, I'm just gonna write them as little scraps here, are all just kind of neutrally charged, right? They don't have a charge. But what can happen if you zoom in on them is because I'm holding a positive charge close to them, the electrons will run, a, will kind of try to be attracted. They can't move off, but they can be attracted to. So all the electrons, whoopsies, try to move to the top. They're all moving towards that positively charged piece of tape. The paper itself still has the same number of protons and electrons, so it's not actually charged. But in that moment that you're holding that piece of paper close to it, it becomes polar or polarized, okay? And that's what's known as induced polarization here, okay? So I think that is kind of the gist of all the concepts from this lesson. Um, it does talk a bit about what semiconductors are here. So I'll have you kind of read in on those. That's kind of linking technology to the concepts that you've been learning about. But it gives you an idea of what charge is, charge, when things are charged, what current is, the movement of electrons, right? And that when we're looking at charge in general, even though we have positive and negative charges, the only thing that's involved are electrons. If you've got more valence electrons than protons, you have a negatively charged ion. And if you have fewer valence electrons than protons, you have a positively charged. But protons and neutrons stay tucked in that nucleus really, really nicely. They're, it's a really strong force that holds them in. So the only thing that's moving is either electrons are moving on or off of the atom. So hopefully that makes sense, everybody. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye.